You know the Bible says, Fear God and give glory to Him. So before we begin, I would like to kneel and ask God for His presence among us. Holy Lord, we come before your presence now in the name of Jesus. We look to you for wisdom. We call on you for grace. Bless us with your presence in this very place. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for caring for us. Speak to our hearts now, we ask. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen. Amen. As time advances unrelenting, forever hustles to the fore. Then heed the master's call, beloved, while Jesus knocks at your heart's door. Romans 13, 11 says it this way, knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. Do these words mean anything to us? Are they just words? God forbid. Friends, loved ones, the words of the Bible are not just words. They are spirit and they are life. They communicate God's will and his intentions for his creatures, his own very, very own handiwork. Through the scriptures, God broadcasts his love, bringing counsel, hope, and comfort, even the assurance of eternal salvation to all who believe in him and trust in him. As time advances on relenting, forever hustles to the fore, now heed the Savior's call, beloved, for Jesus stands and knocks once more. Decisions, decisions. Every day we make decisions. Moment by moment, we exercise the God-given privilege of free will. God did not make us as robots, so he expects us to wisely process all the options set before us and thereafter cast our vote. He says encouragingly in Deuteronomy 30 verse 19, I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore Choose life that you may live. That's a comforting appeal from the Lord God of glory. Today, as we search the scriptures, we do so in the light of the sermon title. Sturdy triplets, mightier than the noise. Sturdy triplets, mightier than the noise. First, let's define the term triplet. The internet site dictionary.com gave me six definitions for the word triplet, two of which are these. Three offspring born at the same time. Another one was any group or combination of three. British Dictionary states, in this case, only four definitions. And the one that I picked says, a group or set of three similar things. Sturdy triplets, mightier than the noise. I'm gonna keep that slide there. So as we go through the sermon, the service, it's gonna be there to remind us. 
Now, what is the history of the term triplet? This term triplet was first used in the 1650s. It was used in reference to three li successive lines of poetry. That's in the 1650s. In 1733, it was used as a set of three of anything. In 1787, that's when we got the most common one, three children at the same birth. And then in 1801, they defined it as three notes played in the tune, in the time of two. Our option today is the definition, any group or combination of three similar things. Four triplets we are going to look at. Now in the Bible, there are many triplets, many, but time would not permit us to focus on each one. So today, we are going to consider only four. You see, these, four trip, these triplets, these four triplets, are like four walls. They form a bulwark, a place of refuge. Person of God, prophets of the exile, pearls on display, placards of mercy. Once again, these are the four. Person of God, prophets of the exile, pearls on display, placards of mercy. Our first text is Jeremiah 10, verse 10. So let's turn to the chapter 10, chapter 10 of Jeremiah. Now this verse, verse 10, is almost in the middle of the chapter, and it appears to be the crest of the chapter's wave. Picture a wave. You have the beginning, you have the crest, and then you have the other side going down. It's almost in the middle. But first, let's consider verse 1, the beginning of the crest, or the beginning of the wave, not the crest. Verse 1 says, Hear the word which the Lord speaks to you, O house of Israel. It's a call to pay attention. Hear the word. That's a command. And couched in this command is the entreaty. Please heed what you hear. Hear the word of the Lord, but at the same time, having heard, heed. Verse 10, let's look at that. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. At his wrath, the earth will tremble and the nations will not be able to endure his indignation. Looking at this verse, we can spend a whole lesson, a whole time dealing with a whole grammar lesson. We're not going to do that. That's not our focus. Structurally, though, this verse has two main parts. We may label these, label these parts as NH and SH. NH, SH. Picture a sphere. Okay, let's say the Earth, our Earth. What would NH represent? Think about that. And what would SH represent? NH, SH. Do we have any takers? Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere. Very good, thank you. So the two parts are like two hemispheres. Like the Earth, which has two hemispheres that are connected but different, so it is with this verse. There are two parts that are different but yet connected. NH is the first part of the verse, and that part talks about the person of God. 
SH, the second part of the verse, talks about nations. It's interesting to note that the first part is the time is present tense. The second part, the time is future tense. So we have a dichotomy here, present, future. NH features our first triplet today. It presents the top tier front row declaration regarding the person of God. Top tier front row declaration regarding the person of God. You see, this first part comprises three, or is comprised of three absolute claims. Three absolute claims. How do we know this? Because of the use of the term or the definite article, the. There is exclusivity here. The Lord is the true God. The Lord is the living God. The Lord is the everlasting King. That's our triplet regarding the person of God. True God, living God, everlasting King. Let's look at each one separately. True God. One religious group ascribes existence to some 30 million gods. Another group recognizes 10 or more deities. When Jeremiah was writing this, there were several Canaanite gods. You see, there are pretend gods, there are make-believe gods, there are manufactured gods, idols, statutes, but there is only one true God, Yahweh, Jehovah. He says of himself in Isaiah 44, verse 6, I am the first and I am the last. In verse 8 of that same chapter, he says, Is there a God beside me? I know not one. Now, this is not arrogance. This is not arrogance. This is compassionate assertion. He says that in the context of the chapter, because the chapter is focusing on God's care for his people. He's a loving God. He's a caring God. He's a compassionate God who does not delight in the death of anyone. He is the living God. He wants to give life. I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose life. That's the focus. So when he says... I am the first and I am the last. He's not suggesting that there's going to be one in between. Is there a God beside me? I know not one. So that's the true God. Next, living God. John 5, 26, New Testament says, For as the Father has life in himself, so has he granted the Son to have life in himself. That's John 5, verse 26. So he has life within himself. This life is unborrowed, underived. He does not need anything or anyone on whom or which to depend for his existence. He has life within himself. We can't understand that. That's a mystery to us. Now, because it is a mystery, does that make it a myth? Does it? Some state that the Christian's God is just a figment of the imagination. And they conclude strongly that there is no God. They cannot understand his existence from everlasting and they term it a myth so he doesn't exist. They don't understand light. They're pondering, is light a wave or is it a particle? They're not sure, but yet they accept that there is light. God is alive. He is the living God. But listen, the reality is this. 
the living God cannot and will not be evicted from his universe. Amen. Now, friends, do you know this? Even professed Christians can deny the existence of the living God. How do we do this? By the way we live, by the choices we make. Think about it. When we turn away from God, the only thing we turn to is death and destruction. For many snares are waiting eagerly to spare and harpoon us. That is why the loving, caring God says in Proverbs 27, 11, My son, my daughter, be wise and make my heart glad that I may answer him that reproacheth me. There is an enemy who wants to destroy, but God wants to build up and to maintain. Amen. When we separate from God, we are left bereft of hope and devoid of life. However, when we stay connected to him, we have life flowing through our beings. By him we live, by him we move, by him we have our being. So the true God, the living God, and we turn our attention to the everlasting king. Our scripture reading said it this way. The Lord reigns, Psalm 93, 1, 2, and 3. The Lord reigns. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed. He has girded himself with strength. Surely the world is established so that it cannot be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters than the mighty waves of the sea. He is the everlasting king. He has been around forever. We can't understand that. That's a mystery. Does it mean that he doesn't exist because we don't understand? No. Now, the second part of the verse reveals a coming judgment. And at that time, the pronouncements that God would make will be irrevocably just. Why? Because of who he is, the true God. He doesn't deal in falsehood. He's the living God. He's the everlasting king. Our God, Jehovah, is the final and ultimate authority in the universe. Think about it. Ultimate authority in the universe. That is why the key thing we need to understand today is Fear God and give glory to him. Fear God and give glory to him. Why do we fear God? He's the true God. He's the living God. He's the everlasting king. These three qualities make him the only person worthy of worship. I say again, the only person worthy of worship. Fear God and give glory to him. You see, God is not willing that any should perish. And so he gives messages of warning in varied forms. The Bible says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secrets to his servants, the prophets. Amos 3, 7. And then in Hebrews 1, verse 1, he said, God at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets. So this brings us to our next triplet. Prophets of the captivity or prophets of the exile. God's chosen people were not always faithful to him. Quite often they were led astray by wicked kings. At times, however, they returned to God during the reign of reform-minded kings. But no matter the state of affairs, unfaithfulness or faithfulness, God always had a prophetic voice in their midst. Jeremiah was a true prophet of God. 
He began his prophetic ministry as a young man during the reign of Josiah. Now, Jeremiah had early contemporary prophets. These prophets were Zephaniah, Nahum, and Habakkuk. You see, God chooses individuals whom he knows would respond and do his bidding. Jeremiah didn't want to do it, but God said, Brother, you have to do it. Not that he wasn't forcing him, but God had chosen him and he was marked out for God's specific purpose. I'm sure God has a plan for each one of us. I know the thoughts that I think of you. Thoughts to prosper you, give you a future and a hope. Everyone is important to God. Everyone is special. So never think for a moment that you don't have any worth. You are God's precious treasure. So, I'm saying like Alan, so, he had, Jeremiah had to deliver strong messages from God to the people of God. And these people were not eager to change their ways and heed God's call of mercy. Even some of Jeremiah's relatives wanted to kill him because of the messages that he was delivering to the people. Yet, he did not shy away from God's calling upon his life, even though he was scorned and derided. You know, God might be calling you for a particular task, a particular ministry. You might be scared, saying, should I accept this call or what should I do? Accept God's call. Jeremiah accepted, and he was blessed, even though he was hunted, even though he was derided, even though he was scorned. He still did God's bidding. His late contemporary prophets were Daniel and Ezekiel. So these three, Jeremiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel, together they form a triplet. Now these three guys may not have personally met each other at any time, but there was a commonality in the source and intent of their messages. What was the key thing? Repentance and return to a right relationship with God. Each of these three men had a specific ministry to a specific group of people. Jeremiah, he remained with the left behind ones, even the ones who ran away to Egypt. They were his ministry's focus. Daniel, on the other hand, was taken to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar in the days of Jehoiakim. And this was the first wave of the Babylonian exile. Daniel ministered in the royal courts of the kings of, Bab King of, Babylon, kings of Babylon and Medo-Persia. Now, although he was in the courts of the king, the palace, he did not forget his people, neither did he forget his homeland. He prayed three times a day, and he stayed connected to the God of his strength. Because of that, he was used of God to interpret dreams and visions. He was God's man. He was dearly beloved. Why? He feared God. And the Bible says, God takes pleasure in those who fear him. Ezekiel. Ezekiel was taken to Babylon during the second wave of the exile, and that was in the days of Jehoiachin. He lived with his fellow captives down by the rivers of Babylon. He, along with his fellow captives, were used as slave labor, digging and maintaining canals branching off from the Euphrates River. It is said that Ezekiel is the prophet of the Spirit. <coughs> Jeremiah is the prophet of the Father. And Daniel, like Isaiah, is the prophet of the Son. In the book of Daniel, we find these terms, 
Son of Man, Messiah the Prince, Michael, focusing on Jesus and the work he does and will do for his chosen people. While these three men were prophets of God, there arose false prophets among the people, spewing false hopes about an early return to Jerusalem, which said they was not going to be destroyed, even though Jeremiah had predicted that it would be destroyed. I see in this a sense or feeling of peace and safety. Take it easy. Now, are there false prophets today? Amen. These false prophets are saying, and Jesus talked about false prophets, beware of them. The church is not going through the great tribulation. That's one thing we're hearing. They're saying that the Jews are going to have a second chance. They're saying that the temple is going to be rebuilt in Jerusalem. You see, our friends don't fully understand Daniel's prophecies. That's why I'm glad that Alan is going to be conducting some classes or lessons, meetings on the book of Daniel. Alan, I know you'll do a good job with God's help. So there we have it. Person of God, true God, living God, everlasting King, prophets of the exile. Now we turn our attention to pearls on display. Did you enjoy that story that Larry gave? Thank you, Larry. Thank you. All this one, pearls on display, is exactly that, talking about the three Hebrew worthies. Daniel had been used by God to interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream. The image, the statue with its various elements. He, King Nebuchadnezzar, King Neb, was pleasantly moved to know that Babylon was that head of gold. He was delighted. Later on, however, by pride, overcome by pride and ambition, he had an image built. But this image, although in similar in form to the one seen in his dream, was made of gold, the golden image. I see a parallel here. Ignore the other elements, just focus on one. Is that an idea of ecumenism? All one. He made the image of one element. And then where was it set up? On the plain of Dura. Do you see that plain? Level ground, level playing field, common ground all together. Why? For the common good. Now what about this image? This image was 60 cubits high, 6 cubits wide. And there were six musical instruments mentioned in the King James and other versions. The new King James only lists five, but there were six instruments. As someone said, 60 cubits, six cubits, six instruments. You see in that three sixes, six, six, six. False worship. Ninety feet tall, nine feet wide, and they said it was placed on a ten-foot pedestal. Pedestal. So then, full from top to bottom to the ground, the plane, that's one hundred feet. The command was given: when you hear the music, bow down and worship. When you hear the music, bow down and worship. You remember what it said in the first verse of. Jeremiah 10, hear the word of the Lord. But now he's saying, when you hear the music, bow down. Music was intended to elicit a certain response. The response was compliance. Listen up and do. Bow down when you hear the music. But these three worthies were not ready to bow down. Why? They had a different drum major. They were not going to march to the beat of that drum. They had a different drum major. 
And as Larry pointed out, they had already decided ahead of time what they were going to do. So even though the king said, hey, I'm giving you a second chance, bow down or else, that didn't faze them. Why? They had a relationship with God. And we need to have a relationship with God ahead of the crisis. Proverbs 24.10 If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. They did not faint because their strength was great. They had already established connection with the life giver, the true God, the living God, the everlasting king. And even though King Nebuchadnezzar thought that he was the sole ruler of this place, he was mistaken. These guys knew the true God. They knew the living God. They knew the everlasting king. The command was given. When you hear the music, bow down. This narrative in Daniel 3 has end time significance for us. End time significance. We're going to be called to come together, common ground, common good. But is that what the Bible says? Is that what we ought to be doing? Fear God and give glory to him. But back to the furnace. The king who had arrogantly thrown them in, hey, what's going on there? As Larry said. And he noticed they had tossed in three, but there were four men in there now, four beings in there. And he called the guys out. Do you notice he couldn't call the true God out? Because he had said before, who is that God who will deliver you out of my hands? Who is that God? Well, that God showed up. The true God, the living God, the everlasting King showed up. Jesus was there with them. He delights in those who fear him. He protected, he preserved them. And another thing, why was it Jesus who showed up and not the Father? Do you know what Acts 17, 31 says? He has appointed a man by whom he will judge the world. And that man was Jesus. The second part of 10, 10 says, the nations will not be able to abide his indignation. So there's a judgment coming. So Jesus was, in a sense, prefiguring what he will do at the end of time. He is the final authority. He is the just judge. But then, he called the men out, and he made a decree thereafter. But you know why? He said, the fourth one looks like the Son of God. Where did he get that idea from? Listen to this. 2 Corinthians 2, 14, 15. Thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph through Christ, and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. So right there in the fiery furnace, the knowledge of God was being diffused because of these three guys who had determined before that they were going to be true to God. He diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge. And it says, in every place. For we are the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. So God wants to use us pearls on display. We have to choose. We have to say, Lord, I want to be your man. Lord, I want to be your girl. I want to be your woman. I want to be the person, the messenger that you intend. Fashion me, mold me, make me again into your image. You know, Ellen White says this, the greatest want of the world is the want of men. Men who will not be bought or sold. Men who in their innermost souls are true and honest. Men who do not fear to call sin by its right name. Men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole. Men who will stand for the right though the heavens fall. And she continues, 
But such a character is not the result of accident. It is not due to special favors or endowments of providence. A noble character is a result of self-discipline, of the subjection of the lower to the higher nature, the surrender of self for the service of love to God and man. And she says, the youth need to be impressed with the truth that their endowments are not their own. Strength, time, intellect are all but lent treasures. They belong to God, and it should be the resolve of every youth to put them to the highest use. He is a branch from which God expects fruit, a steward whose capital must yield increase, a light to illuminate the world's darkness. Even though there was fire in the furnace, there was darkness about. They illuminated the place with the light of the knowledge of God because they had committed themselves to him. Are we committed to God? We need to be. And this brings us to our last triplet, placards of mercy. You know what that is. A placard is put on public display. And the placard of mercy, placards of mercy, our last triplet is found in Revelation 14, 6 to 12. We call them the three angels, three angels, three angels messages. The remnant in the last days are to diffuse the fragrance of the knowledge of Christ. We are called to proclaim the three angels' messages, which in verity are placards of mercy. They present God's final call to a perishing world. You see, the world is God's, and he is going to reclaim it. The world is God's, and he's going to reclaim it. So we have to decide what we're going to do. You see, the question has always been, is God's word really true? That is the question. That, is a, that was the first question in the Bible in, in Genesis 3. Did God really say? And this, with this image and the scene in Daniel 3, did God really say you should not bow down to an image? And then in the final analysis, the question is going to be, did God really say that the seventh day is the Sabbath? You see, in the Daniel incident, he heated the, in the, the guy's incident, the fiery furnace incident, not Daniel. Well, it's in the book of Daniel. <laughs> he heated the furnace seven times hotter. These guys were Seventh-day Adventists. So he wanted to get rid of the Seventh-day Adventists. And that is going to be the same thing in the end. Our focus would be, are we going to heed the word of God? Or are we going to listen to another authority? Because there is another authority. Inspired by the enemy, the evil one. It's all he's doing. He wants to take over. He, he wanted to do that in heaven. But he was kicked out, so he came here. And he wants to claim this as his own. In fact, he's called the prince of the air, prince of the world. We have to choose. Decisions, decisions. The three messages. Return to the true worship of God. The true worship as, of God as creator. Fear God and give glory to him. He's the one who made. And if you go back to Jeremiah 10, verse 12, he says, well, verse 11, Thus shall ye say to them, The gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, they shall perish from the earth and from under the heavens. And talking about God in verse 12, He has made the earth by his power. He has established the world by his wisdom and has stretched out the heavens at his discretion. So God is the ruler. He is the everlasting king. There's a song that we wanted to sing, but I guess we didn't, we don't know it. It's in the old hymnal. The Lord Jehovah reigns. I'm not going to sing it. I'm just going to say what the words say. The Lord Jehovah reigns. 
His throne is built on high. The garments he assumes are light and majesty. His glories shine with beams so bright, no mortal eye can bear the sight. The thunders of his hand keep the wide world in awe. His wrath and justice stand to guard his holy law. And where his love resolves to bless, his truth confirms and seals the grace. Through all his mighty works, amazing wisdom shines, confounds the powers of hell and all their dark designs. Strong is his arm and shall fulfill his great decrees and sovereign will. And will this sovereign king of glory condescend? And will he write his name, my father and my friend? Here's the decision. I love his name. I love his word. Join all my powers to praise the Lord. So we turn to the true worship of God because Babylon is fallen and because there's a warning against receiving the mark of the beast. As time advances on relenting, forever hustles to the fore, let's heed the counsel freely given and welcome paradise once more. Father God, your mercy is everlasting. Your truth endures to all generations. Thank you for your words to our hearts today. Sturdy triplets, mightier than the noise. Nebuchadnezzar asked, who is that God? But you revealed yourself to him, yet in mercy, the true God, the living God, the everlasting King. Be Lord of our lives, we ask. Draw us closer to you and use us for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray.